What am I missing right now? You guys are watching these things for a long time. I'm, I'm focused on you. What am I missing? Tell me. Thank you, Grant. You don't have to have a suit. We have protective gear. Wear long sleeves. We've got a veil and helmet and gloves. Wear long sleeves and long pants and close toe shoes. You have to sign a waiver. If you can fill it out online and print it and bring it with you, we'll save everybody time. But if you don't, we'll have copies at the training. Second, get a snack or something while our guest speaker comes up. I'll introduce him in just a second. If I could, real quick, you know, I've been doing the Ed? snacks and, and uh, we were taking donations, and this beautiful, beautiful donation box was created. Would you guys um, stand up where are you, Nancy? Where are you? So then, J. Craig Wright called and said he would like to sponsor snacks. So I didn't have the heart to call you. So, so yeah, thank you. Um, so if anybody needs any mortgage stuff, his cards are over here. But come get snacks. He's taking care of the snacks this month. I think next month, for as long as he wants to do that. The donation box is still out because it's beautiful. But don't feel like... You know, go ahead and spend his money if you want. <laughs> or go ahead and donate. Thank you very much. Sorry for taking your time.
If everybody can start to take their seats, we'll get started. Excited to be able to talk about this subject, and I'm grateful that we're able to work with it. 
Lord, I just pray uh, that in this time that you'll continue to be exalted. That we'll be able to see your hand work around us, God. And that folks will come to know you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So my name is Jamie Ellis. It's absolutely my pleasure to be able to speak to you this evening. Thank you for coming out to listen. I'm accompanied by two of our four children. The smallest one is Evelyn Grace. The youngest one is Evelyn Grace. The next one up is Jude, our third and fourth children. So it's good to have, have them here tonight. I said they might listen to the talk, but I'm starting to doubt it. All right, so um, it is a pleasure for me to be able to speak to you this evening. I was asking my hosts at lunch what I should speak to you about tonight, and they weren't sure, and I wasn't sure. So my team and I have about 250 or so lectures in our library, and so usually when folks leave it up to me to decide, I, it's really hard for me to decide because we got a lot of talks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this the democratic way, and we're really terrible at voting in the United States, but we're going to try to get this right tonight, and I'm the only count that matters, so I'm going to do my best to count. Hopefully it won't be close so that I don't have to recount. And what we're going to do is I'm going to give you three options for talks, and you are going to tell me what you want to hear. Do you understand so far how this works? Yeah. All right. I just want to make sure. I do not want to see you in court about this. All right. So the first option is just 100% practical. It's how to recognize queen problems and fix them. All right. The second talk is a mix of science and practical. It's all about nutritional supplements, pollen pads. So I talked to you about how they work, if they work, and some research we did on them to inform how we recommend or don't recommend their use. So the second one's kind of a mix of science and practical. The third one is 100% biology, and it's mating biology of the honeybee. You are interested in knowing how queens and drones do their thing. That is that talk. It's 100% biology. As a scientist, I can 100% code it so that the young ears, including my own young ears, won't be able to read between the lines. All right? So one more time. The first option is recognizing and addressing queen problems. 100% what beekeepers do. The second one, kind of a mix of science and, and uh, practical uh, application, and that's the, the nutritional supplement, pollen patties, we'll call it. And the third one, of course, is mating biology of honeybees. And I keep records of all the talks that I give to every club. I'm, I've given over a thousand talks to beekeeper clubs around the world. And so I look back through 2016 of all the talks that I gave to your group. So I know that I did not give either of those three talks to your club. So you may have seen them somewhere else at another club meeting or online or joining one of our Zoom calls, but I have not stood before you in giving those talks. So do you understand the vote? Yeah. All right, let's see if we can do this. All right. First option, who wants to see something about recognizing queen problems and fixing those problems? Okay, I'm not going to count or you see if it's close. Who wants to see something about nutritional supplements, pollen pads? Okay, that's definitely not the winner. All right, and the third one, who wants to see the native biology of honey? Well, you, you are most fervent in your vote, but it's, it matters not how loud we are. It only matters, which our government could use, so it matters not how loud we are, it only matters what the actual vote was. So what we're going to do tonight is that it looks like the first group won. So, it matters not to me, because I, they're all the same to me. But, so we're going to talk a little bit about queen issues and how to recognize them and address them. Um, for those of you who've known me for a while, I've been at UF in August 16 years, and I finally crossed the reader threshold. So I, I like to look at people without them, but I have to read, read with them. So give me a second as I pull up the presentation. <laughs>
All right. So that's the Columbus LB tonight. So we got the vote. Life is good. That's good. So again, my name is Jamie Ellis. I do work for the Etymology and Dermatology Department at the University of Florida. Um, I believe last month you had Amy Boo speak yeah. to you. Yeah. So Amy Boo is a colleague of mine. She did a good job? Yeah. yeah she's great. So we both work in the same building. So the beekeepers in the state of Florida, you probably know, built a new bee lab at the University of Florida campus. It opened in 2018. We moved into it. We've been there ever since. It's a great place um, to work. We brought on Amy three, I think, years ago, or two years ago, I forget. She's been with us for a couple of years, maybe three years now, and she's doing a great job. I believe she gave you an overview of what we do at the lab. All right, so with that out of the way, I do work with the entomology and nematology department. What, what does entomology mean? <laughs> Study of insects. What does nematology mean? <laughs> Study of nematodes. A lot of people say worms, but they're nematodes, which are worm-like creatures. I have been told, and I say this a lot, I don't know if it's true, but we have a few nem nematologists in our department, and they say that there are more nem nematodes than like any other living organism that's not a microorganism on planet Earth. And if you could snap your fingers and make all matter disappear and leave only the nematodes, you'd still have the shape of everything that exists because there are just that many, including on you and in you, just all over the place. Okay. So we have a few faculty members who study nematodes, but most of us are entomologists, we study insects. My background is, um, I started keeping bees when I was 12 years old. You can tell that I'm from the South, and you hear it in my accent. I've lived in multiple places around the world and traveled every continent except Antarctica, but I still have a really Southern accent. So I'm from Georgia, and when I was in Georgia, I started keeping bees when I was 12 years old. I've been keeping bees um, essentially ever since. I didn't, I, I let my bees go the last two years because I just ran out of time, but I just can't live without them, so I'm getting some next weekend. It's killing me not having them. I try to live vicariously. I try to live vicariously through my lab, but it's not working, so I have to get them on that. All right. So here's the, the most boring part of the presentation. So I drove from High Springs to get here. It was about three hours to get here. When we are done, we're going to head three hours back. The only pit stop we're making is to get a McFlurry at McDonald's on the way out, because I promised the kids that they'd go with us to get McFlurry. And in all of this effort, <clears throat> in all of this, I came down here to give you a presentation, the first slide of which is going to be super boring. But this will be the only boring slide, I hope, and I hope it gets better for you. But what I want to tell you is that this talk is essentially split into two parts. Recognizing problems with queens and fixing problems with queens. You got that so far? Now, a lot of people wonder why I give this talk. How many of you have ever heard of the Be Informed Partnership? Okay, some of you have heard. That's good. So the Be Informed Partnership is a national group that keeps track of the number of honeybee colonies that we have in the United States. And according to the Bee Informed Partnership, they do this through beekeeper surveys. So they basically send out a survey every year. In fact, when I was sitting in the parking lot of the place we ate for dinner, I was checking my email, and they've sent out the results from this past year's survey. So the survey just hit the press a few hours ago. And the survey tells us how many colonies we had, how many colonies we have. You can calculate loss rates from that. And then they ask the beekeepers, what's killing your bees? And so beekeepers every year list their top five stressors, their top 10 stressors, and every year queen quality is in the top five. That means every beekeeper, a hobbyist, sideline, or commercial, complain about queens at some point in their colonies. And so I've been keeping bees 32 years, and, I can, and, and it's funny, when I first started educating folks about bees, I would say there's basically two things you need to be able to do in order to make productive colonies and have lots of honey. Number one, you've got to control diseases and pests. And number two, you've got to manage your queens. And essentially, the Bee Informed Partnership Survey simply added a third to it. And the third is, is you've got to manage their nutrition. So beekeeping is about 90% varroa management, queen management, and nutrition management. Yes, lots of other things happen to bees. But you're going to spend a lot of your time managing queens, food, and mites. If you're not managing queens, food, and mites, your bees are probably dying and you're wondering why it's happening. So essentially, this talk is addressing one-third of those big issues. You probably have a lot of varroa talks every year, I'm guessing. Varroa is a nasty critter. It's a 
principal kill, biological killer of honeybees is a terrible thing, but I'm not talking to you about Brooklyn today. Instead, I'm talking to you about Queens. And I always like to tell people what I want you to know by the time this presentation is over. It is no use to me to just spat out hot air if we're not both going in a direction together. Okay, so here's the direction that we are headed. Number one, I want you to be able to recognize the stressors of honeybees as related to queens. Number two, I want you to be able to know if it's a big deal or a moderate deal or it's not a big deal at all. I get lots of emails and lots of phone calls and lots of questions every year, and people freak out when they see issues in their honeybee colonies, especially if they're new beekeepers. How many of you have been a new beekeeper, saw something you didn't recognize, and thought the world was going to cave in very shortly? All right, so I'm going to help you triage these queen issues so that you'll know if it's something I need to deal with now or eventually, or if I, if I get to it, it might not be a big deal at all. And then number three and four, basically I'm going to tell you how to deal with it. So if I do my job, by the time this presentation is over, we will have successfully gone through all four of those rounds. I am not very good at being tethered, so I must become a All right, so triage. How many of you have ever been to the emergency room? What's the first thing that they do when they get you there, right? They register you, and secondly, they take me to a triage nurse who has to decide, is this person a pansy or is there really something going on that we need to address? <laughs> the longer you sit in the emergency room, the more you are on the pansy scale, right? <laughs> you realize that's how it works, right? When it's an emergency, they take you back. When you're just a big baby, they leave you in the emergency But in all seriousness, they will scale you to determine how quickly they need to get you back. It's triage. How important is it for me to deal with this issue now? If you say anything about your chest, you're going to see a doctor quickly. If you say my hand hurts, you'll be lucky to see a doctor in the next 10 years. It's just they're doing exactly what I'm going to do with you now. Which is when I go through the queen issues, they're either low threats, moderate threats, or significant threats. So a low threat is something that in theory is capable of killing bees, but usually doesn't. A moderate threat is something that's very common and can cause a problem if you don't address it. And a high threat means if you don't do something about it, your bees have a high likelihood of suffering significantly. Does that make sense? So as I go through these queen issues, one of those three buttons is going to be on each of those pages so that you'll know that this is something I need to know and address that, or it's something that I can get to eventually. And I did this on purpose to help hopefully make some of you feel better about some of the things that you are saying. Now, I put on this slide the most common issues that you're going to run into with queens. Number one, limited access to them. Number two, they're dead or missing. Number three, they're bad. Number four, laying workers, five, suit procedure. Six, multiple queens, and swarming, and then Africanized honeybees. There's other things that can happen to queens, but these are the issues that I'm going to talk with you about tonight, and hopefully by the time this presentation is over, help you know how to recognize them, triage them, and address them. All right, and we're going to go through each of these individually, so let's just start with the first one. How many of you do not keep bees? You, you do not keep bees. This whole thing is new to you. All right, so let's start very briefly from the beginning. Every honeybee colony, we hope, has at least one honeybee queen. The queen is the individual in the nest who lays all the eggs. Therefore, every bee in that nest is her offspring. Just to drop some knowledge on you, because this is absolutely free information, queens and workers come from the same eggs. So a queen could have been a worker. A worker could have been a queen. When the egg passes out the chute, when the queen lays that female egg, the worker bees either feed the offspring a lot or they feed the offspring a little. If they feed it a lot of high quality food, it becomes a queen. If they feed it a little bit of low quality food, it becomes a worker. Did you get that? Yeah. All right. So essentially, a worker could have been a queen. A queen could have been a worker. The only thing that pushed them one way or the other was the diet that they were given while they were immature bees. I give another talk called Task of the Worker Honeybees, and I explain how remarkable that system is. Because with the same stinking set of DNA, you get two completely different individuals. 
one that can live multiple years, whose most complicated job is the mating behavior, and one who lives six weeks, who goes through a whole assortment of tasks that queens aren't even capable of doing. But they carry the same genes, and both could have been the other. That's just remarkable. That shows you the power of gene and environment to control what it is that happens. The genes being what's making them who they are, but the environment that's pushing them one direction or the other. So queens, we need them. We have to have them in our colonies, but the average colony loses its queen more than one time a year. We used to say one time a year is pretty normal. I'm going to talk about a lot of this. But when I was a postdoc at the University of Georgia, I did a, a project with six commercial beekeepers, and I marked their queens, 30 colonies each beekeeper for two years, and the average queen in our study, in that study, was living six to ten months. If you don't mark and click your queens, you don't know that's happening, right? If your queens are not marked and clipped, you just see an egg-laying mama in there and assume it's the same one you saw last time. But that's not a safe assumption. So your colonies are turning over queens every year. Now, yes, you might have a queen that's been in there three years. If you click and mark her, you can know that. But that's, you know, we're talking about a bell curve here. There are some queens who live a long time, some who live weeks, but most of them are that probably eight to 10 months around the colony, eight to 12 months. This is important because if that is true, that means every one of your bee colonies is going to be queenless at some point in the year. Now, the good news about all of this is bees didn't need humans to help them stay alive throughout history. Bees have a way of making more queens. If they didn't, they all die. But the system is not fail-proof. Occasionally, colonies try to make queens, maybe 10% of the time, and fail to do so appropriately. Furthermore, you may lose a queen at the time of the year that you don't want to lose a queen, which might be when? Leading up to the major honey flow. Or maybe in November, December, or January when you cannot purchase or make a new one. So dead or missing queens can be a low threat, if it occurs at a time of the year, it doesn't matter much. Or a high threat, if it occurs at a time of the year that it makes a difference in your colony making honey or not. Or, on average, it's a moderate threat. Probably needs to be watched. You need to make sure the bees successfully deal with it. But if they don't, you're going to have to step in and address it. Furthermore, the queen producing companies around the U.S. usually only start having queens available roughly April through, in many good cases, September. So if you lose a queen outside of that window, it's up to Mother Nature to fix that problem for you. And in November, December, January, and February, Mother Nature doesn't do a good job of that because it's just not easy to produce queens. So it can be a significant threat, a low threat, so I just kind of average it out and call it a moderate threat. So if you can't get queens or make queens, it's a problem. Now, now let's talk about the most obvious one of all. Dead queens. How many of you have ever seen a dead queen? How many of you have been responsible for that one? <laughs> this is confession. We'll move the table and there'll be an altar here at the end of this presentation. It's a problem. It's a problem because even though colonies have a system for overcoming this, there, like I said earlier, there's times of the year that you don't want this to happen. So let's just do a little bit of math because it's easy to do it with this slide. And I'm going to round everything up to the nearest week because it's easier for me to discuss it that way. Okay? Colony goes queenless. It takes them about two weeks for the next queen to emerge. It takes that queen about two weeks. I should have used the other finger. Two weeks. It takes that queen about two weeks to mate. When she lays her first first egg, it takes that first egg three weeks to go through complete developmental stages and produce for you a worker emerging from the comb. How many fingers and thumbs am I holding up at the moment? Seven. That means when your colony goes queenless and you allow that colony to requeen itself, it's seven weeks before your new queen is born, mated, laying, and producing offspring that's of use to your hive. Maybe that's not a big deal this time of year because there's not a honey flow right around the corner. But if this happens in March or April, it's devastating to your honey flow. 
So having a dead queen could be a problem. Yes, bees have a biological system for fixing that, but they don't mail it in overnight. It takes time for a colony to fix this naturally. And also, depending on the season that they're having to address this, it could kill your bees. If your colony loses its queen in November and you do nothing to help, your colony is going to die. Because in November, December, January, in most places in the temperate North America, they cannot requeen themselves. So a dead or missing a queen is a significant threat. Now, I'm about to get on my soapbox and stay here for a while. This is a very, very, very important one for me. And some of you are going to be unhappy with me by the time I click the next button on this slide. I just wanted to throw that out there. All right? When I was a brand new beekeeper, I was a lot like probably many of you, which is if I saw a queen in the hive, I was absolutely elated. It really didn't matter if the queen laid one egg a year. As long as she was present, I was happy. You giggle because you know that's you. So a couple of years ago, I was asked by some Italian colleagues of mine to write a chapter in a new book that they were putting together. This is a long story. I apologize for it, but I was right. They asked me to write a chapter in a book that they're putting together called Welfare of the Honeybee Colony Superworkers. And the idea is that a honeybee colony is a lot like a, a mammal. In the same way that we have obligations to take care of the mammals that we keep, we have an obligation to take care of honeybee colonies. And if we lived in Europe, the European Union has an organization called OIE, and I believe it's in French or Italian, but it basically is the office in Europe that deals with epizootics. Diseases and stresses of animals. And they have this system where they recognize five welfares or five rights for animals that are managed by humans. Now, I'm not arguing here whether or not we should eat animals. I'm just arguing that we do. So we should probably take care of them in the lead up to eating them. Which I know sounds weird, but that's, that was their idea. So, they claim that if we are going to keep animals, animals have the right to be free from stress, right to be free from hunger, and three other rights. I forget what they are. But the idea is if we're going to manage animals, we, we have an ethical obligation to take care of them while they are under our care. Do you understand that? All right. So, they, my colleagues, my Italian colleagues, were making the same ethical argument about honeybees. So many of us will get them and throw them in the backyard, and we don't think about a colony the same way that we would think about a cow or a cat or a sheep. We go, they're just bees. Insects can't feel stress. It's no big whoopee, but they can. Colonies can exhibit stress. And my responsibility for that book was to write a chapter on how honeybee colonies manifest stress when infected by diseases or infested by pests, and how honeybee colonies try to overcome that stress. So long story short, in my opinion, in my new opinion over the last few years, I believe if we, have, if we keep these, we have an ethical obligation to do what it takes to make sure that we reduce stress in their colony as much as possible. Do you understand that? So I believe if we are going to keep these, we have an obligation to keep them correctly. For example, I kill Varroa. Varroa kills my bees. I don't like that. So I kill Varroa. Like managing Varroa, I believe, is an ethical obligation we have as beekeepers. Making sure that bees are free of nutritional stress, I believe, is an ethical obligation for beekeepers. So why am I telling you that on this slide? I submit to you that one of the ways we let our colonies down the most is we allow inferior queens to be the ones that lead our colonies. And inferior queens lead to a whole host of downstream problems for our colonies. But we're so happy because she's there. And I would argue that we need to step up our threshold for what we call acceptable and be willing to requeen our colonies when she's bad. Because having a bad queen is bad for your colony, and I believe we have an ethical obligation to take care of our colonies. Model the dots there. So what is a bad queen? A bad queen could be a drone land queen. You didn't ask for the copulation presentation, so I can't tell you how 
let this happen. But what I will tell you is that if queens do not lay properly or at all, they can only lay unfertilized eggs. This is so crazy. How many of you, okay, so you're new teachers. So if queen bee, when she lays an egg, when she passes that thing through the chute, she can allow semen to hit it or withhold semen. If she allows semen to hit it, it's fertilized, it becomes a female. If she withholds semen, it's unfertilized, and it becomes a male. That's like freaky. Isn't it? We, we don't appreciate that. It's in our colonies every day, but we don't think about it. Honeybee drones, the males, have no fathers. It does not take a man to make a man in a honeybee. <laughs> now, one of the fun trivia questions about honeybees is drones have no fathers, but they do have a grandfather. They have a maternal grandfather. They don't have a paternal grandfather because they have no paternal, right? But they have a maternal grandfather. So drones, if queen, I know it's crazy stuff. This happens like in your colonies all the time. And all we want to do is harvest their vomit and put it in glass jars and dance around. But these things are like super crazy, crazy things. Okay, so I digress. Three folks. All right. So if a queen does not lay properly, she doesn't collect enough semen. And if she doesn't have enough semen, she can't lay fertilized eggs. And if she can't lay fertilized eggs, she produces drones. And drones are worthless. Well, I'm going to stick up for drones. I want to stick up briefly for drones. Drones get a bad rap. Yes, they sit around and do nothing else all day long. All they do is eat and go out and look for love. Um, but if, it, if drones didn't exist, our workers wouldn't be who they are. Drones are giving as much DNA to the workers as the queen is. So they're incredibly useful from that regard, but otherwise they do get the moniker that they're useless. So why is this important? Well, if you have a colony of just drones, the colony's doomed because colony, drones can't forage, can't build wax, can't take care of babies, can't tend the queen. Heck, they can't even feed them snake themselves once they cross a certain age. They're, they're essentially flying sperm, and that is not an oversimplification. <laughs> drones are haploid. They are literally flying sperm. They're sperm that are fuzzy with wings that can go and try to win it. It's really crazy stuff. All right, so furthermore, not only can queens run out of semen or maybe improperly make, but, gosh, I'm going to overtalk. You said 9 o'clock, right? I got to be out of here. Y'all have to be out of here now, so I got to finish it for me to answer questions. Gotta move faster. But queens have a special organ in their body that they nourish the semen that they collect. Remember, they only mate the first two weeks of their life, and only on one mating flight or maybe two mating flights. So if they live to be two years old, they're fertilizing eggs from semen that they collected from males that died two years ago. So sometimes the sperm keeping alive apparatus fails of the queen, and now she's got no good sperm left, and she's laying eggs that she thinks she's fertilizing, but the sperm is no good, so it's also become trouble. Queens can become inbred. It's real simple. If you live on an island and you have one colony and your colony goes queenless, there's no other colonies, the resulting queen only has her brothers to mate with. If you have two colonies, the, the resulting queen in the first one has a 50-50 chance of mating with her brothers. You get the drift. When a, this is one of those crazy things about bees that people need to work out. But work for honeybees can detect inbred eggs. They can detect when an egg has been fertilized by semen that is from a relative of the queen. And they will abort those eggs. So one of the leading causes of spotty brood patterns, like you see on this slide, is simply inbreeding. Queens that mated with bees that were too related to them. That's I say a leading cause. It's one of the many causes of spotty brood patterns. So when you see this, you can say to yourself, maybe there's something going on. Maybe the queen is maimed or injured. Maybe she's gotten too old, but she's so daggone cute, and she's been around in your hive for two years, and she produced so much honey last year, and you named her, you even painted her tarsi like fingernails, and it's crazy. But, you know, if she's not doing her thing, your colony might die because of your sentimental value for her. Right? And finally, she might also be just bad. You know, sometimes things pass on genes that just aren't nice genes. Right? 
So you can have a queen that looks good and smells good and talks good and made it well, but she's passing on bad genes to her offspring, and now they're mean or disease susceptible or not productive or, 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 or. So we have to raise our threshold and say, this is an issue that we need to address if we want our colonies to be healthy and productive. All right, I'm off the soapbox now. Now, to make bee biology even stinking crazier, a colony can attempt to rear a queen but fail to do so. It's biology. Biology's messy. Just look around the room, right? <laughs> All right. Biology's messy. So a colony can go queenless. They can try to rear a queen, but the stinking bird can eat the queen while she's on a mating flight. Lots of things can happen. Lots of things can happen. So in an instance where a colony goes helplessly queenless, the workers, who are all females, some of them, their ovaries will begin to develop, and they will become able to lay eggs. Workers, though, do not have a spermatheca. Neither can they mate. So workers cannot collect and use semen. So while workers can lay eggs, they cannot lay fertile eggs, which means when workers start laying eggs, they produce only drones. drones. We've already talked about drones. Workers are real now, listen, I'm going to chase a rabbit very quickly here. I'm not going to say much about it, but if you're curious, you can ask me later. There is one subspecies of honeybee that lives in South Africa where the workers can produce female offspring without mating. It's called Parthenogenesis. parthenogenesis is the genetic term for it. I'm sure you all do that. And in Thelotoki, a worker can lay an egg that is not fertilized and it will become a worker without the help of a male. But for the rest of the worker honeybees, including yours, they don't do that. Well, they don't do it 99.999% of the time. Technically possible, but forget that I said that. All right, so <laughs> workers, when they lay eggs, the vast majority of their offspring is going to be drones. Workers seem to be so happy that they're given the opportunity to lay that they will often lay multiple eggs per cell. If I have a situation where my colony was queenless, and a few weeks later, I'm seeing multiple eggs per cell, my mind instantly goes to laying workers. Now, with the small caveat that sometimes newly mated queens also lay multiple eggs per cell, but they always work their way out of it in a week or two. Laying workers never work their way out of it. It always looks like this. And laying workers will stick eggs in the back of the cell and on the walls of the cell. They'll even stick eggs in cells that have pollen in it anywhere they can put their rear end and deposit an egg, they will do it. But workers can't produce females in most cases. But the colony's doomed. To make matters worse, the workers take on the pheromonal bouquet of a queen. Colonies think they have a queen. So you buy a queen and feed it into the colony. The bees release her out of the cage in two to four days, and then they stink her to death. And you're like, oh, man, I'm an idiot. I must have done something wrong. So you buy another queen, and you put it in the colony, and the bees release it, and they kill it, and you go, oh, man, what's happening? You do it again, and you fed three $35 queens to this colony before you go, oh, yeah, they got laying workers. The bees think they have a queen when they have laying workers, and they will not make the new queen, and they will not accept the new queen that you're feeding to them, except using one technique that I'm going to talk about at the end of this presentation, so you have to wait until the bitterness. So laying workers are a big deal. You have to address this. Failure to recognize and address laying workers and your colony is going to die. That's just it. It will die. Super procedure. This is a tricky one, but I'm going to speak now in generalities. And hopefully this piece of money comes up. It does. Hopefully this piece of money comes up. It does. Okay. So imagine this is a cone, and I'm speaking in super duper generalities here. Right? But this is the general thing beekeepers look for. Imagine you pull the frame out of the hive, and it's swarm season. Bees are going to try to make a new queen during swarm season so that the old queen and half the bees can leave, and a new queen can come out of a queen cell and take over the hive. Generally speaking, swarm cells occur on the perimeter of combs. Yes, they can occur on the face of the comb, 
But generally speaking, if you're in swarm season and there are cells around the edge of the cone, your bees are thinking about swarming. It's a planned event. They'll make a swarm cup, a queen will lay an egg in it, the bees will develop at that cell, and that produces a queen that was going to be the queen from the beginning. They knew they wanted her, they were producing her, and life is good. Supersedure is a colony's emergency response to a missing queen or a failing queen. And in those scenarios, they're not planned events. They're responses to an emergency. Our queen is gone or she's bad. So what the bees then do is they go to the youngest available female larvae and take them from the direction of becoming workers and try to push them into the direction of becoming queens. So as a result, generally speaking, supersedure cells tend to occur on the face of the cone because they're going to where the female larvae are that were heading towards becoming a worker and they try to redirect them. This is an oversimplification, but when you see supersedure cells, you can think to yourself, what do my bees see that I don't? Is my queen there? Is she failing? Is she maimed? Why are the bees trying to replace her? So anytime I do see supersedure cells, I do a risk assessment and go, yeah, I see her. She's got a great brood pattern. Life is good. These bees are just dumb. And so I remove all the queen cells. But if I see supersedure cells and can recognize the problem, I might help that colony to address whatever the problem is. Again, that was super overgeneralized. But in general, you'll see swarm cells on the perimeter, supersedure cells on the face. And I'll just give you a small but significant timeline. When a larva emerges out of an egg on day three, for the first two days, all larvae are treated the same. They are all fed royal jelly. Roughly 48 hours, the larvae that will become workers get a new diet and less of it, and the larvae that will become queens continue to get royal jelly and more than they can eat. So anything within 48 hours of emergence is totipotent. It can become very easily one or the other. Anything in 48 to 72 hours was already kind of heading down the worker path and is now being redirected to a queen, and so you can get more inferior queens. It is better if bees think from the beginning that we want a queen and try to make that happen than, oh crap, we need a queen and try to make that happen. So if you averaged it out across all supersedure queens and all swarm produced queens, you'd probably have slightly smaller queens that are produced from supersedure cells, and smaller queens are generally viewed as worse in the bee world. It's an oversimplification, but that's a good general. So while they're telling you something, it could also lead to the production of an inferior queen. Listen, you can get workers far enough down the path that when they're direct, redirected, you've got neither a worker nor a queen. We actually have a term for this. We call them pseudo queens. They're, they were really far down the path before they were redirected, and now you've got something that's kind of in between the two. I know a lot about this. This was my high school science fair project. There's a, when I was a kid, this is super nerd. I can't help it. There's a hormone in bees that help direct bees and becoming workers and queens. It's called juvenile hormone. And juvenile hormone has a synthetic version, a man-made version. It's very similar, but not quite the same thing. It's called methaprene. Methaprene's in a lot of mosquito control uh, stuff that they will put in water to kill the immature bees. Well, it's also in a lot of flea killers. And so I was using flea killers to rear honeybee queens when I was a kid because methaprene and juvenile hormone are very similar. Pretty nerdy, huh? All right, so moving on. Multiple queens. I always tell my, so I, I'm a youth minister. You could probably see the Southern Baptist in it. And I always tell my youth, when you're up until you're 18, the strongest rule of the world. But after 18, the smartest rule of the world. In some cases. So I always tell you, all right, be strong until you're 18. But after 18, you better be smart if you want to advance yourself. So that was for, for all the young people in the crowd. Multiple queens. Now, I, I did my PhD in South Africa just because I love to travel. 
and for other reasons. But I did a lot of work with observation hives. When I was looking at these glass beehives all the time, morning, noon, and night, I would routinely see colonies that had two queens. You probably all saw the two queens in this picture. And I was like, well, this must be an African bee phenomenon. Those bees are kind of wonky anyway. They're a little different than the bees we have here. Their behavior is kind of slightly different. Hey, I love these bees. I would study them forever if I could. They're among my favorite bees on planet Earth. But their behavior is a little wonky compared to the bees that we have. And so I'm like, this must just be an African bee thing. I probably won't see it when I get back home. When I got home, I started seeing it. Certain times of the year, I can see it in 10%, maybe 20% of my colleagues. And what happens is most of you don't see it because when you pull a frame and see a queen, you're like, hey, she's there, that's good. And when you put that frame back in and go five frames later and you pull up a frame and see her again, they're like, that's a fast queen. She totally got on the wall of that box, ran all the way down there and got on that next frame. You're like, hey, she's so fast. And so you write it off as the queen is just super mobile. Or you'll go, man, she's here. And you flip it over and go, man, she must have crawled through a hole to get to the other side of the frame. Most people only notice it when they're like beside each other. But if you'll look, at a certain time of year, a lot of colonies might have multiple queens. And I see it a fair amount. I say, you know, like I said, it's warm season, maybe 10 to 20 percent of colonies. But I say it's a low threat because I have never seen this result in a problem. Every time I notice it, it seems to fix itself. One of the queens remains a few weeks later, and life is good. So I've never had to address it, but I can envision a scenario that they don't like each other, and they fight each other to the death, and now they're both dead. But I haven't seen that, but I can certainly envision a scenario where that happens. How does this happen in the first place? The short answer is I don't know. My guess is, is that one of the queens is an older queen whose pheromone output is plummeted. So while she's in there and laying lots of eggs, the worker bees are getting mixed signals. Yeah, we've got lots of brood, but we can't smell a mom, so we need to make a mom. So they make one. And now they've got two, but they don't realize they've still got their old one, and there's just a little bit of confusion. But like I said, at the end of the day, it seems to sort itself out. Swarming. I could spend the rest of this talk on here, but I can't because I need to get you out of here by 9 o'clock. Swarming is reproduction. Now, I'm going to be as not graphic as I can be while being as graphic as I can be. So I got to talk on swarms. And swarming is simply honeybee reproduction. Most of you probably think that honeybees reproduce by making more bees, right? They try to make more bees. If that were true, our colonies would get infinitely large. That would be their goal. But we know that's not what colonies do. Colonies try to take one colony and make it two. That's reproduction. That's how honeybee colonies reproduce. They take one colony and make it two. And they really want to reproduce. I don't want to be graphic, but I'll stop that statement. Let me restart another statement. Everything that can reproduce wants to really bad. Doesn't it? Right? Right? You can say, well, I didn't reproduce. We didn't have children. I'm like, well, I bet you didn't stop doing what it took to have children. Why? Because everything that can reproduce really, really wants to. You giggle. That's, I'm totally licensed. I can talk about this kind of stuff. So, <laughs> Colonies want to reproduce. Swarming is colony reproduction. Colonies want to take one colony and make two. And that is a baby bee colony. That colony has successfully reproduced. It's thrown out a child into the world and said good luck. But the thing about swarming is they don't just kind of throw them out and say good luck. They try to throw them out at a time of the year that favors the success of that swarm. What time of year is that? Well, that time of year is the weeks leading up to the major nectar flow. Because this baby bee colony has nothing except bees. And they've got to find a cavity, move into it, build comb, have brood, store pollen, and store about 70 to 100 pounds of honey before the honey flow stops and shuts them off. And now they have no more resources to get to winter, let alone through winter. So the earlier in the major nectar flow they swarm, the more likely the swarm is going to survive winter. That's why your bees are trying to swarm while you're producing honey. That's why it's hard to control swarm. It's hard to control anything that's trying to reproduce. Isn't it, parents? So when we are trying to control swarming, and we are trying to control the most fundamental thing that colonies want to do, and we're trying, and they're trying to do it at a time of year that will stop your honey production. What does this have to do with, with queens? It has 
has to do with queens because it creates a queenless colony when you most need a queen. Leading up to the major nectar flow, your colony just split. You just lost your queen. You remember the fingers and thumbs I did earlier. Now you're going to wait seven weeks until the new queen emerges, mates, lays its egg, and its offspring emerge from the combs that are useful to the colony. So basically, when your colony swarms in the weeks leading up to the major nectar flow, it's going to take the entire major nectar flow, then some, before you have a stable colony again. So queen loss in swarming is a problem because swarming is a problem if you want to have productive colonies. And then, of course, Africanized honeybees. This is a whole other talk or another day. I told you I did my PhD in South Africa. Um, I work with a lot of these bees. I think they're remarkable, remarkable honeybees. But you know, they don't always have a nice temperament, right? That's how they're known. They can be quite defensive. Is this relevant to you? It is relevant to you because your colony is going to go queenless at least once a year. There's a reasonably high resident population of feral African bees in this area. That means when your colonies go queenless, there's a pretty reasonable chance that your virgin queens are going to be mating with drones that carry that trait right there. So you have to say, are my bees defensive? Are African bees in the area? How do I need to address this if my colony gets quite grumpy and I need to do something about it? Or how can I hedge my best if my queens are going? You can't control who the queen mates with, can you? Right? You can't control who your kids bring home. This is exactly the same thing with queens. They go out. As far as we can tell, it's just the fastest males in this war. 20,000 are chasing her. The first 20 are the ones she mates with, right? So you can't control that and you can get problems. And just as a quick summary, you don't have access to queen, she's dead, she's missing, she's failing, laying worker, super procedure, multiple queen swarming or after queen. So how do we deal with it, right? This is the recognition half and the triage half, how big of an issue is it? Now we're moving into the what do we do about it? And there's only one way that I'm going to share with you that fixes every one of these problems. A lot of these other ways are pretty good at chipping away at most of these problems, but the best is last, so you have to wait until the better end. And it really just boils down to requeening, making sure that colonies have a good, healthy, productive queen in that nest. And so there's really four ways that I can talk about requeening. You can allow the colony to do it itself. You can give it a right queen cell. I'm going to talk about all these, don't worry. You can introduce an adult queen, and you can requeen using a new. Now, I'm going to give you, with this slide, the best management practice, but it's not the most managed practice. In theory, it is best to dequeen a colony, usually 24 to 48 hours, before you requeen. But in practice, how many of us can go back the next day or two days later? So most of us, if we have a failing queen or we need to do something to her, we'll dequeen it and requeen it at the same time. If you do have time and do dequeen it for a day to two days before you take the queen strat or requeening strategy, when you go back that one or two days later, the bees are going to start to have made, they will have started making queen cells. You're going to need to remove those. Because once they started making queen cells, they might be more prone to take theirs than what you do for them. Unless, of course, giving them a queen cell is what you want to do for them. We'll talk about that. All right. So, the queen. Beekeepers call this, this euthanizing a queen is called pinching a queen. That's, that's the beekeeper lingo for it. Everywhere I go, they talk about pinching queens. Usually, you pinch them and throw them in the bushes. Right? Some of you might be entomologists, so you might put them in a jar and freeze them and stick a pin through their back so that they can go into the collection somewhere. <laughs> they live on, and it, sorry. So what's the first step? You can't just allow the colony to do it itself. Bees make queens. That's what they do. Well, that's among things they do. But you can allow them to requeen itself. We've talked about some of the pros and cons of that, but let me talk about more specifically. This, this is, in theory, a way that you do not have to give cash to solve the problem. I'm not saying it's not costly. It costs you. 
seven weeks of brood production, possibly a honey flow, but at least you didn't pay someone for something. Right? So it's not like it's a free method to bring queen, even though there's no exchange of money. It can cost you. And there are better times of the year to do this than others. If I'm going into the major nectar flow, I'm not doing this. If I'm in July or August, I'm like, yeah, I don't care. I don't really care. It's okay with me if I make a new queen. I don't need all the bees. I don't need all that brood. They can go for a seven-week period. It's no big deal me. So when you do this, this is essentially what you're looking for. The queen cell on the left, the queen has emerged normally. How do I know that? The tip is open. I also know that she, there won't be any more queens emerging in this nest. How do I know that? Because the cell right beside hers was also a queen cell, and it's been opened from the side. Why has it been opened from the side? Because the one that came out of the tip went to that other queen cell, bit a hole in it, and said, hey, I'm your sister, and stung her to death. <laughs> and then she went like a heat-seeking missile through the rest of the colony looking for more queen cells to buy holes in the side of the wall and sting her sister to death. Gummit. Sorry, that was a great question. As a matter of fact, <laughs> queens, that's probably more where I am now, right? right? Queens pipe and quack. You know queens make noise, right? It's like, that's really good. Like if I was by a bee colony, I could have frozen all the workers. <laughs> oh, you laugh. I totally could have. Now, when they're in a queen cell, the newly emerged queen will make that noise, and the queens in the queen cell will go. But the queen's basically saying, where, 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 where are you? And the other one's like, we're over here, we're over here. She's like, thank you for telling me. And she goes, and me. there's like this stupid language going on, and it's like the queens are totally fine being asked, just so that they can make sure that there's a, oh, it is crazy in a hundred times. Crazy. So, yes, this is technically free, but I told you it can take, depending on where you catch it, three to six weeks or longer to get a new queen. So what do I do if I allow a call to requeen itself? I've already told you it's totally overgeneralized, but in general, the bigger the cell, the more attention it receives to become a queen. The bigger the queen. Again, it's a super overgeneral. You can get a small queen that's super good, a big queen that's super terrible. But in general, what I will do if I find a queenless colony and I'm outside that window where I will purchase one, in other words, I just allow them to remake themselves, I will go through the nest and I will try to find the biggest possible queen cell and I will remove all other queen cells. I make the selection. And the reason I do this is let's say you're in swarm season and your colony swarm. That first queen to emerge will not always be the one who takes over the nest. She may lead a secondary swarm. The next queen to emerge may not take over the nest. She may lead a tertiary swarm. How many of you have had a colony swarm multiple times? A lot. All of you have. You probably only saw the first one. Right? So you can get a secondary and tertiary swarm. What I will do is I will often remove all the cells except the largest one. These days I usually leave the largest two because there's a high enough chance that one of them is bad and you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. So, that is. so what I tend to do is leave the largest two cells that I can find on eggs frame so that the first mama doesn't have far to go to look for the second mama. If she's on the opposite end of the box, I still may end up with two queens emerging at the same time if I'm not careful. So I often leave the two largest cells on one frame. And then I allow Mother Nature to take its course. And if all goes well, six, seven weeks, I've got brood emerging. And again, it's free in the sense I did not give someone money, but it's not free in the sense that it cost me brood production of bees and maybe I wanted to split or maybe I wanted to go into a honey float or whatever. Also, your colony can have no young females from which to choose. Remember, if they're trying to make a queen, it's possible that the queen was failing before they recognized she was failing. So she might be present but have stopped laying eggs weeks ago. So there may not be young from which to choose to make a new queen. So you can go to your most productive colony and move a frame of eggs and young larvae from it to your queenless colony and allow the queenless colony to make queens from that. And then you just choose the biggest two cells in the world. When you see this, like I said, you were successful. This is the mama who emerged naturally and she went and killed her sisters. All right, second option. Now I've got to speed through these next two because I want to spend a little bit of time on the last one and I know we got to get you out of here. Second option, 
You can reclaim with a right so. A lot of commercial beekeepers do this. They might have 5,000 colonies, and instead of requeening them all, they just go and buy queen cells. You can buy queens or queen cells for most queen breeders. The queen cells are a lot cheaper. I don't even know what the going price is these days. My guess is a fully mated queen is probably 30 to 40 bucks. Am I right? And my guess a queen cell is between around 10? Four? Four dollars. All right. So you can get these really cheap. And the commercial beekeepers will just stick one in every colony and let Mother Nature take its course. The beauty of queen cells is they're a lot cheaper. Number two, you bring in genetics from the outside. Number three, it's a little bit further along, especially if you have to de-queen the colony and allow them to start from scratch. You might have saved yourself a week or two this way. There are some downsides, though, and one of the downsides is you still have to go through the rest of the process. She has to emerge, mate, and lay eggs. Secondly, there is a minor risk that the workers in the nest will not like that cell and will abort that individual. And the queen, uh, the beekeeping equipment companies, to remedy that, they make these little cages here that's a lot like a hair roller. They slide over a queen cell, and these two prongs push into the wax to protect that cell from the workers chewing into the side walls of that cell. Does that make sense? They're queen cell protectors is their fancy name. But you still go through, it's, it's cheaper than buying a mated queen, but you still go through all that time-related stuff that you have to deal with. The third way, which is incredibly popular among new beekeepers, because this is usually what they're told to do by their mentors, which is just buy a queen. We have beekeepers whose job it is to make queens. That's what they do. Anybody in here making cell queens? All right. So we've got beekeepers who invest a lot of time in the production and selection of queens. Queens are, I don't know, $30 to $40. So the benefit of this is you've cut out the roughly two-week developmental time, the roughly two-week mating time, so you save yourself about a month. You put this mated queen in there, and you've got a queen who comes out and instantly starts laying eggs, and you've cut out about a month, and I'm oversimplifying it, but about a month of loss. Of course, they, they're a more expensive option. But it may save you in the long run if, if your bees are going to fail to do it all together. This is an incredibly common way. I like this method because it brings in new genetics. They also come to you mated, so hopefully the failure part has already been weeded out. Those who didn't mate are gone. And also queen breeders who sell queens will watch those queens in those mating newts and ensure that they're producing worker offspring before they cage them and sell them to you. So we also know that there's a much lower likelihood that they are drone layers or that they're going to fail and things like that. But again, it costs money. And also, you can't buy them year-round. Right? There's a queen production season. That's because drones are only produced at certain times of the year, and colonies can only make queens the times of the year they make drones because they need drones to be able to mate with the queens. If you buy queens, they're going to come in one of many cage styles. This is kind of the traditional one that I cut my teeth with when I was a kid. And this is a newer sleek wooden model. There's these plastic models, but they're all roughly built on the same idea that candy of some sort is in an opening that keeps the queen caged in that cage. In these plastic cages, the candy would be here. In this wooden cage, the candy is here, and there's an opening on the end. The idea is that while the bees in the colony are chewing through that candy, they are becoming accustomed to the queen through the mesh. So that by the time they've made it all the way through the candy and the queen can come out, they've accepted her and life is good. Of course, life's not perfect, so occasionally they can release a queen and kill her. I like to manually release my queens, but this comes with some experience. What do I do? I will go to my colonies, usually about four days later. So basically, I'll put a cage in my colony and leave it corked on both ends so the bees can't get to the candy. And when I go in, I remove the cage and I watch the behavior of the workers on that cage. If I can take my finger and easily brush those workers around the face of the cage, they have probably accepted her. 
If I take my finger and it's really hard to move workers, they're biting the wires and they're really thick on the cage, they're basically trying to get in there and rip her head off. So if you release her, they're going to continue that process. So if they're easy to move, I'll open it up and let me just give you a quick for what it's worth. Mated queens that are in queen cages can fly. They just wait in reality. Because everybody who's the first time you ever open a queen cage to release her into the colony, you always open her up here and then turn it down here and you go. <laughs> oh, you laugh. That, you know you've done it. So let me tell you, the good news is 90 plus percent of the time I have seen this happen with my own eyes. She's in that colony a week later. I cannot explain it. She must have understood the odor of that colony. She'd never been out of it before. But most of the time, your stomach's going to drop into your feet, but it will not be an issue. But there are times that she'll fly away, and that's a problem. So what I'll do often is just like pop the, the, the top and then open it into the colony. Then I will always pull out a comb and watch the bee's response to her. If they're attacking her, I'll put her back in the cage. If they're not attacking her, I put everything back together and move on. So those are just some Jamie tricks. But you will watch her fly away. I'm telling you, your stomach's going to drop on your feet. And you're going to remember, Jamie said it's probably going to be okay. You'll come back a week later and hopefully I'm right. If not, you can complain to Amy. I'm going to give you just a very quick... One more thing about cage queens. Remember, in this style at least, there's only screen on one side. So if you put the screen parallel to the comb, you're completely closing the screen and the worker bees can't get used to her. So the cage has to be turned perpendicular to the frame, right? The screen has to be facing into the area between frames. Furthermore, I like to put the candy end up and at a slant upside down. You just see how crazy I am, I'll tell you why. A lot of these cages come with worker attendants in those cages. If they die in transit and the candy end is down, the dead workers can fall and clog the holes. So the queen can't get out if the candy's eaten. But I don't like to put the candy straight up because if for whatever reason it softens, it can run down on the queen and kill her in the cage. So I tend to turn it screen side down at a slight slant, but with the candy end up. So if stuff does run, it runs on the screen and the bees outside the cage can eat it. This is just me being overly crazy. But this is what I do, and it works most of the time. All right, the last thing I'll tell you about. All of you take out your phones, if you have a smartphone, and open your camera app. We're going to do this together. Some of you are nervous. I get it. All this all right, so take your camera app and point it at the little Tyrannosaurus Rex right there in the middle of the QR code. If your camera is smart, there will be a little button that comes up, right? I'm going to do this myself just to see if it works. Feedback. Yep, mine came up with a yellow button. I've got an iPhone. I click on the yellow button and it takes me to the website that is this document, this is always fun for me to watch. I'm not asking you to take a picture of it. I'm asking you to point your camera at it and a link should pop up if you just click on it. If you're under six, help the people beside you. Wow. All right. uh, I'll leave it up for a few more seconds. And then in a minute, I'm going to tell you the old school way of looking at this. All right. This is my absolute favorite way to deal with every queen problem I just <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> you dealt with this, All right, I've got to progress. So I'll tell you, I'm going to show you the old way of finding it too, so don't worry, it's okay. My favorite way to solve every queen problem I mentioned is this way here. 
everything I've told you up until this point, allowing a clot to requin itself, requining with a queen cell, or buying a queen, all three of these, you know, can't do things like solve light worker problems, or at least easily, unless you're kind of really finessing the system. But this thing, I absolutely love. And I call it requeening using a nuke. If you did successfully go to that link, there's a document that shows you everything I'm about to tell you. So you don't have to do anything except listen right now, and then you can go back and read it later. And again, I'm gonna show you in a moment the old school way of doing it. It's real simple. If you look at this image, you've got two production colonies and one nucleus colony in between the two. I use the nucleus colony to requeen production colonies anytime my production colonies have queen issues. So I try to make sure that there are queens in my nukes, and let me show you how I requeen them. I, I developed this schematic, I know it's a little tricky, but let's say that this box on the left, the bigger one at the top, this is a production colony with 10 frames, and if it's got a queen problem, then you've got honey and pollen on the, honey and pollen on the edges, and empty combs or old brood and queen cells in the middle. Then you have a nuke here on the right. It's got honey pollen brood and a queen. What I'll do is I'll go into my production colony and remove five frames. I make sure one of those is a honey and pollen frame. And then I take out frames of bees, maybe old empty comb, maybe a couple of frames with queen cells on them. So now I've only got five frames left in my production colony. Then I take all of these frames and push them up against one edge of the box, unlike what you see here. Those five frames that I took out, I set on the ground beside the column. So my production colony has five frames. I scoop them all up against one side of the box, like you see in the upper left um, column. Then it's real simple. I take every frame, these brood, honey, pollen, queen, everything from the nuke, this one here, and drop it into that empty space. So now you can see it combined. Then I take all five of those frames that originally came from the production column that's now sitting on the ground, and I put them into the empty nuke box. So now I'm solving a queen problem in my nuke that only exists to help me solve queen problems, and my production colony doesn't miss a beat. So with my nuke, I can allow it to requeen itself or buy a cage queen or put it in a cell, but my production colonies don't miss a beat. This works when you go into your colonies and go, oh dang, they swarm. This works when you go into your colonies and go, oh man, I've got laying workers. This is always requeen laying worker colonies for me. And I do it in real time. Frames out, nuke in, Frames and nuke, boxes back together, move on to the next hive. I don't use newspaper, I don't spray bees with sugar water, I don't read them a bedtime story, I just put that stuff together and I move on because this is what commercial beekeepers do. Ain't nobody got time for that. So they're just combining stuff and moving on. And I absolutely love this method of requeening colonies because it solves every problem that I have. Every problem that I've talked to you about from queens. Remember, if you lose a queen, you don't just lose a queen, you lose bees and brood. Well, when you use a queen, bees, and brood to requeen a colony, you instantly, it's like, it's like it never happened. So this is a really useful way for me to stay on top of queen issues. You have to be out at night, and I've got to give you a little bit of time for questions. So what I'm going to do is remind you that I was supposed to help you recognize the stressors of queens, or of honey congelated queens, know that those are low, moderate, or significant threats, know some pros and cons of the various ways to requeen, and order the ways of requeening a colony using a cage queen or new. So that's what I try to do. Hopefully I tag all of those bases. Now it's fun phone game number two, where you can point it at this screen. It's tricky. This, this one I will confess is tricky. There's two QR codes on this one. And if your camera is sees them both, it's going to try to go to both, which is it won't work. So it's better to zoom into the one on the left. The one on the left takes you to my last website. Once you've got that link open, turn your camera back on and do the one on the right. And the one on the right takes you to the world's best podcast. <laughs> yes, true. Okay, perfect. Perfect. All right.
right, so if you just take a picture of this, you can zoom into one and hold down on it, and it will pop back up that link, and then you can go to it. So just take pictures, and then go home, zoom in on the one you want, hold down on it, and it'll take you to that website. Great suggestion. So the one on the left takes you to my lab's website. The one on the right takes you to the World's Best Podcast. You also can have a screenshot of our lab's web address. You can follow the lab on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. That's at UF Money B Lab. And, of course, the world's best podcast is two bees in a podcast. I'm sure you all listen to that. I hope. All right. So my email address is also there. I've taken you right to the end. Look, we've got to get out of here by now. And i got to give away stuff. And he's got to give away stuff. So I will take the best three questions you have, and then I'm going to stand away, let them give away some stuff, and walk out the door so that I won't be a detractor to you anymore. The best three questions. Okay. Stand up if you've got a question. Best three questions. Over here. Okay. I was going to ask, is there anything that pushes the queen to the less or longer of the future? What might affect queen longevity was the question. And a trillion things affect queen longevity. Um, diseases, pests, exposure to pesticide residues, um, nutrition, a lot of things affect queen longevity. And so some people are saying one of the things that we need to address is queen longevity, and people are trying to figure out how to do that best right now. Um, one of the ways that they think they can get on top of that is ensuring a much stable rearing environment for the bees so the colonies that are producing them are disease and pest free as much as that is possible, that they are nutritionally fit so the stuff that they're feeding the queens is good enough to help them last longer. But gosh, there's so much that goes into that. It is like the explosion of bee research right now is how to keep queens alive longer. Okay. That's, that's a great question. Next question. The question is, if I use the nuke to requeen a laying worker colony, do I have to kill the laying workers or take half of it away? I don't do any of that. For some reason, every time I requeen using a nuke, the laying workers just, it just solves its own itself. 99% of the time. It, it is a remarkable way to requeen colonies, especially laying worker colonies. There's more than one person standing up, so we're going to, I was getting through those questions pretty quick, so let's do all three of them and see, maybe four, maybe four. You first. So the question is, is if I if I'm going to re if I'm going to go left. <laughs> Sometimes it just happens. I can't stop it. Um, the question is, is, do I kill the queen and put her carcass on the cage of the queen? Then? That's what yeah. The, so that helps the bees know that she's dead and all that stuff. I I've never done that. I feel like I've got good success. I understand the logic behind it, but I've just never seen the need to do that. So that's a great question. It's a great question. Yeah, I totally get that. I, I've heard that myself as well, but I don't think it's necessary. That's a good comment. Do you believe there's part of the genesis in our, in our test species? Does that actually occur? In us? Us? Yeah, in our bees. Oh, in bees. Okay. <laughs> I was like, now you were asking something, but I've got to really go. <laughs> okay. Thelotokus. Parthenogenesis is the ability of an unfertilized egg to become a female. Does it happen in our bees? Yes, but it's 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 significantly less common than it is in Capensis, the Cape honeybee, where it's the rule rather than exception. So, in theory, when your colonies produce laying workers, one out of every thousand eggs they lay can be a female, but it's it's just so not so common. RBs, but Capensis is what they do. Now, you, now, just to answer the first part that I thought we were asking, in theory, everything's capable of this from bees up. This is why if you, um, this is why if you only have female fish in a fish tank, you can still have babies. The aquarium see this kind of thing happen all the time, and it's happening through parthenogenesis. Same thing with birds. Again, in theory, the higher organ that you're organized you are, the less likely it is to happen. That's what happened in Jurassic Park. In Jurassic Park, it was. So I was going to mention Jurassic Park. But in, in, in theory, 
in theory, um, it doesn't happen much in us. But probably never. We'll just say that. Well, Lord, he said that's all I can do. Hey, you have my email address? We'll take it out. Give away stuff for more questions. No, you want to give away stuff. There's like a really nice thing coming. So I'm going to quiet. This is about, y'all have 12 minutes. Literally, we got this going. So you guys are going to All right, we're going to go through this raffle fairly quickly. Uh, the new will do last. We're going to do all the regular stuff first, and we're going to. Um, All right, we had 428 raffle tickets, starting with 1794 and going up to 2221. All right, first number. We're going to give away a blue high tool. And I'm going to go quick here, run up and get your stuff, and give uh, Bobby your ticket. 2010. Two, zero, Blue Hive Tool. It's a Hive Tool that's blue. <laughs> Bottle of Honey. 1997. 1997. Uncapping roller, 2119. We have got an assortment of Burt's Bees uh, cosmetic products. Did I describe that right? Thank you. 2220. 2220. Next, we have Linda. What is this? Is this a is this a honey? Linda's new book about Glory Bee, The Adventures of Glory Bee, two zero one seven. Thank you, Linda. Smoker fuel. Smoker fuel. One eight three four. One eight three four. All right. Now this next. No, not that. This next thing is a. This is a igloo cooler that they sell at Publix and Target. All that. They make really nice swarm traps. It's actually the same material as those thirty dollars swarm traps. I picked up some of these at Publix the other day on clearance for two dollars. I got eight of them, I don't need one of them around. But it's worth so much more. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta drill the hole in it though. One, eight, two, three. Normally they're nine dollars. They're just on clearance for some reason. They weren't at the beekeepers like when I told Becky about them. She goes, where, where, where? <laughs> More smoker fuel. One eight nine one. One eight nine one. A bee house, a mason bee house, and butterfly mating house. One eight five seven. One eight five seven.
Sunday. All right, and the, the final item for tonight is the 10 inch data smoker. Oh, my computer doesn't crash. One nine six four. All right, the nuke, this is an actual nuke, nucleus colony of honeybees. There are actual bees in here. It's got a screen bottom and a screen top. There's no bees flying around. Hopefully nobody's got a stun. Is that pretty good? Okay. Open it um, show everybody. <laughs> I, I want to I thank Sebastian for donating this. In, uh, and I also want to make a plug for one other thing. Um, we're also doing another Queen Bee group buy for set for the meat delivery at the September meeting. Uh, you can order it on the website. I'll send out an email probably tomorrow. Um, Sebastian is, is also providing the queens for the Queen Bee um, group buy. He's he's not donating them, but we're, we're buying them from him. <laughs> All right. So the winner we had 190 tickets for the new. We had Carl Lewis bought 25 tickets. He lives in Mississippi and he doesn't have these. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the All right, so Carl Lewis, I'm sure, is going to donate this to the club. <laughs> but thank you, Carl, if you're watching online. Thank you very much. And thank you for everyone. This was a great meeting, great attendance. Uh, thanks for coming. And we'll see you outside if we if you have any further questions. We have to be out of here in three minutes, five minutes.